introduce is Marv Eichstead. She's already introduced herself as an oceanographer, but I've known her for a long time when she's a, a, a great scientist as well as a leader, as she is the lead principal scientist for the Nansen Legacy. And we have had a brief out on that for the uh, a six year program. Um, and she also interfaces with the, uh, the DBO Observing, which is another one of performance elements on our, our collaborative team. So I'm happy about that. Her focus is on uh, vertical flux uh, and working with, uh, looking at the pelagic connections and also with the, with the benthos. And she connects both uh, the biology with physical forcing and into modeling. So with that, I'd um, like to go ahead and welcome Mar to begin her presentation. And once again, thank you for taking the time because I know it's your evening in Norway. Thank you very much, Jackie. So then I share my screen and hope that you can see my presentation. Um, Looks good. Perfect. Okay. Uh, the Nansen Legacy Project is a Norwegian uh, joint effort where Arctic marine expertise from 10 different research uh, institutions and universities have joined their forces to uh, explore um, the effects of the changing climate and ecosystem of the Barents Sea. So it's an interdisciplinary effort. It's a huge project for Norwegian standards of uh, uh, approximately 80 million US dollars and half of the funding is in kind from these 10 different institutions. It's a six year project and we have just finished the first year. And um, uh, it's called the Nansen Legacy. And the reason for that is uh, Fritjof Nansen, who was a great uh, polar scientist among many other things. He made very important discoveries about the Arctic Ocean, both ocean currents and the, the Arctic ice drift. He had his uh, vessel Fram built uh, 125 years ago and set aside and drifted across the Arctic Ocean. But the Arctic Ocean that he studied and drifted across um, is hardly um, the same anymore. So we have a new uh, Arctic Ocean and a new situation in the Arctic that we need to go out and study. And one of the most prominent changes that has taken place is the decrease in the sea ice uh, extent. And this uh, sea ice decrease is not only prominent uh, in the summer where it is very strong, but also in the winter, as seen here from this figure by Perovic et al. from the Arctic Report card. And in the Barents Sea region, uh, we uh, noticed this change particularly well. Ah, my screen is frozen, but I hope it will be able to move. Um, I have to stop share and start again, I think, just to see if I can make this move. Occasionally, people will have to um, use the um, either the buttons on their keyboard or the buttons on the screen because one or the other won't work for some reason. Soon. Yeah, I try this the the keyboard. Can you see it again? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's um, Characteristic for this region in, uh, on the Barents Sea is the Atlantic water inflow that brings both heat and salt, which is uh, setting the, uh, the hydrographic characterization of this area pretty strongly. So it's huge amounts of, of heat that is brought in and that impacts uh, the sea ice condition in this region. And this figure goes from the central Arctic Ocean on the x-axis and clockwise to the Canadian, Beaufort, Chachi, East Siberian, and the Laptev Sea. Uh, and all these areas have been characterized with a decrease in the summer period, mainly uh, in this period, which was until 2016. It's a work by Unar Heimetal. Well, when we come to the Barents Sea, we see that there is huge decrease in sea ice, both in the uh, early spring and in the late autumn. So earlier uh, melting and later freeze up. And this is also the case for areas further 
east, and we think that this is also spreading out now, as have been seen in the in the Bering and the Churchy the past two years. So we are um, an early warning, perhaps, on what is going to happen on many other shelf uh, seas in the Arctic, and what we uh, discover in this project may be of great interest across the Arctic. So uh, we already see consequences in the ecosystem in the Barren Sea. These two figures shows the distribution of different groups of fishes. To the left, it's a cold year from 2004, and the Atlantic fishes is confined to the most uh, Atlantic impacted area in Southwest, while the Arctic fishes uh, is uh, dominating in the North. But in a warm year in 2012, the Atlantic fishes have expanded, taken more space in the Barents Sea, and the Arctic fishes are really confined to the shelf break into the deep basin. And at present, we see that the Atlantic cod is actually found all through the Barents Sea. Um, this has implication for, uh, for the Barents Sea and the fisheries management we do in this region because it's mainly based on knowledge from this area in Southwest. And now there is a great interest to, um, to also extend the fisheries further north. But the climate uh, is changing the area, it's reducing the sea ice. We also have other harvestable resources like the snow crab, which is expanding in the Barents Sea. Uh, in addition to fisheries, there is also interest to increase the petroleum further north, and there is an increase in the maritime activities. And at the same time, there are uh, limited quality on the weather forecast in this area due to four, few observations, and there is challenging logistics because it's far away from where people is living. And the research we have from this area is fragmented and to a large degree outdated. So uh, Norway has a great interest in increasing the knowledge in the north, and that's why the Nansen Legacy project was established. So we had our kickoff meeting uh, in uh, Tromsø in March last year, a year ago. We are about 130 scientists, and we are employing now um, about 50 recruitment positions, uh, both PhD and postdocs, and we will continue to do so for still another year, since it's a long project. And we have uh, a broad um, disciplinary coverage uh, to represent both uh, geology, uh, ocean currents, sea ice physics, atmosphere, and biology across different fields to integrate this. And also climate projections um, is an important part of the project. So there are uh, two main pillars uh, in the project, or actually four, two of them are the physical impact and the human impact that both impact on the living barren sea, which is in the core of the project. And to understand what the future will be like, we have to understand what is the situation today. And we also have to understand how the situation was in the past. So due to that, the uh, geological course to investigate past climate is important. And Norway got the new icebreaker last year. So the first cruise uh, set out in August and that was a Nansen Legacy cruise. So that's a very important infrastructure to carry out this project. To say a little bit more on the physical drivers, um, the map uh, or the figure here illustrates how the Atlantic water is impacting different regions of the Barents Sea. Svalbard is seen here. Uh, and the Arctic part of the shelf is here in the north. And we need to investigate external forcing through currents uh, and sea ice drift. Sea ice comes in from north. Internal forcing like change in stratification, climate history, and global and regional climate simulations. We also need to address different kinds of human impact and especially the multiple stressors that affect the ecosystem. And they represent uh, both ocean acidification, contaminants and food web and harvesting, and the combination of these. The Living Barrier Sea is uh, a key, and at present we actually do not have a full overview of what is the, the biota in that area due to the big changes taking place. So we need both to characterize and to quantify the biota. We also need to investigate timing of key biological processes as they change with the changing sea ice seasons. 
um, the production across trophic level and food web structure and carbon cycling. And for the future Barency, we need to resolve the mechanisms that govern sea ice cover, climate state and predictive capability. So we do that through working on weather ice ocean forecast models, on climate predictions and project scenarios, on biogeochemical variability, on dynamic ecosystem models, and by evaluating indicators for an early warning of state change. We had four cruises last year. Uh, our key transect uh, goes through uh, the Barents Sea. And if we look at this map here to the right, we see that we go from the Atlantic impacted area in the central Barents Sea, uh, cross the polar front and go through the Arctic shelf and into the deep basin. And on this left side shows the actual stations that were investigated. Um, there are process stations where we uh, do a lot of physical and biological and chemical process uh, measurements. There are moorings which are located to catch the inflow of biological or the, the Atlantic water inflow, but also some uh, biology. And the yellow dots show course that was taken for a geological investigation. And this climate gradient will be investigated every year in five years. And starting in August 2019, this year, we also do a seasonal survey. So we will have cruises both in August, December, March and May to be synoptic with the drift of Polarstern in the mosaic. So we can compare at least these two different regions uh, at different seasons. So we use this climatic gradient to investigate uh, across uh, the different topics, physical, biological interactions, the ecosystems and how contaminants are brought through the food webs, the weather and climate, and also the past variability. And it's also important to ensure that we have the data available for the society uh, as soon as possible and in the future. So our cruises was pilot studies this year, where we deployed mooring, did baseline studies. We start our seasonal approach now in August. We'll have a transect prolonged further into the Arctic Basin in 2029. And in 2022, we have the topic open to close gaps that will uh, open during the, um, the project period. And we try to include um, some people from media and collaborating scientists on each of the cruises. Technological in development uh, and use across discipline is very important to extend the scales we can operate both in time and space. And that helps us to uh, get a holistic understanding of what is uh, going on, uh, combining both uh, across uh, time and space, but also carrying sensors for different um, uh, measurements from different disciplines. So that's uh, an important part to uh, enable use of, uh, of technology and un underwater robotics also under sea ice and at high latitude where communication is a um, challenging issue. So we hope to deliver both uh, forecasts for the coming days and improve the weather forecasts to improve uh, predictions of fisheries and harvestable resources in the coming years. And we also have a prospective to 2050 to deliver different kinds of scenarios of what we think uh, will be uh, the development in this area. And we do that in collaboration with stakeholders of different kinds. And working in the Barents Sea, we are working um, in an area which represents the inflow to the Arctic Ocean. But there are also many other who are working both uh, in uh, related uh, projects in the same area, but also in uh, projects that address uh, the situation further into the Arctic Basin or on the Pacific water inflow. As the Arctic Ocean is integrating uh, the entire or signals from many different areas through the ocean currents, we think it's very important to, to link across. So we have collaboration with many projects. Some are represented or given as examples here. It includes the Changing Arctic Ocean projects from the UK that have been working uh, on the same transects as we have done. We talked ahead of our project, so that was good. Uh, Arctic ABC's uh, infrastructure program, year polar prediction on weather. 
uh, synoptic Arctic surveys and the planning, the distributed biological observatory. I'll come a little bit back to that. Uh, mosaic drift I mentioned and also Arctic amplification is an atmospheric project that will also fly transect across uh, our vessel on its way out to Polarstern. And we have some uh, collaboration with projects uh, that work in the Russian waters and the Arctic Science Partnership uh, around the Canadian and the Greenland area. So we uh, try to link up and are interested in linking up more to establish collaboration across. And uh, the Atlantic DBO uh, is inspired by uh, the DBO you have on the Pacific side. Uh, I think it's a great idea to join forces and to do better investigations in, uh, uh, on, on a selected group of stations. So we had a workshop on the Atlantic side some years ago where we made an agreement on uh, four main transect lines and the Nansen legacy line is one of them. Um, the other lines are uh, transects that already are uh, sampled by different uh, institutions, but they are usually sampled uh, once every year. So we hope to improve so we can extend the sampling frequency and, uh, um, and get better data on that. Um, just recently, uh, Neil Banas used uh, uh, current field uh, from the CINMOD models and ran uh, particle tracking through uh, the different transects. Uh, it's one south uh, tip on Svalbard, it's one across um, the Fram Strait, the House Garden, uh, it's one in the Ripfjord uh, north of uh, Svalbard, and it's the Nansen Legacy transect. And we think that we can cover uh, and grasp signal from a quite uh, good area, uh, both upstream and, and downstream. So we, um, we work to move forward, but it's not going so fast because I had this Nansen legacy project coming on top of <laughs> my, my uh, attempt to establish this. But we are moving forward in collaboration with both people from Poland and uh, Germany and, and UK, um, among others. And if you want more info, I'll be happy to provide that. And if you have questions, I'll be very happy to take that. Excellent, Mark. Thank you so much for, because I, you know, from the, from the inspiration up to the uh, concluding my field and modeling, uh, it's just pretty exciting. And then this uh, Z who is on the line here is also looking at tracking modeling on the hotspots and DBO sites in the Pacific sector. So he may have a question, but thank you. Any, are there any questions? So I know you're going to do the seasonality for the uh, starting this year. Will this be a, a one-year opportunity, and then, or will it continue through the life of the uh, Nansen Legacy? Uh, the seasonality study, we uh, unfortunately only have the possibility to carry out uh, over this one year. But uh, it may be that when we uh, are identifying the uh, the knowledge gap that we will uh, go out once more during winter or uh, late autumn, which will be seasons that are not so well covered. But uh, we don't know yet uh, about that. Sure, no, I understood. But you've got a modeling component running parallel to your science sampling right now. So that's we great. We do. Okay. So, um, so we hope to, to get more data. And there are also other people working in the area and we try to send them to the Nansen Legacy transect or to some of the others so we can extend our seasonal uh, uh, knowledge uh, about this system because we are uh, in lack of winter data. We have um, data more from the summer period, but with a new icebreaker, we have new opportunities to go further into the ice also in the winter and also further into the Arctic Basin than compared to what we have been able to earlier. So that's um, extending our opportunities quite a lot. Great. Are there any other questions? So uh, I do have a question. So on the 
with the Nansen legacy, and I know there's a lot of uh, cross-organizational components to that, including the Institute of Marine Research. And so the information from the annual surveys, they, it feeds into the Nansen legacy too for the fisheries and upper tropics. Yes, the, the Nansen legacy transect is, uh, uh, is matching one of the transect lines of the Institute of Marine Research, and they are doing annual service for, uh, on the fisheries, but they are mainly investigated harvestable resources. So, uh, and they have not so much on the phytoplankton and microbial mm -hmm. uh, side. So we try to complement each other. And uh, this year we will run almost parallel with the Nansen Legacy and the ecosystem crews. So they will do more trawling and we will um, do other kind of process studies so that we can match and have um, a synoptic sampling for, for these efforts. So we try to link in as far as we can. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Because I can continue going on, but I know we have to. <laughs> but I can talk to Mart on this side. So at, at that point, unless there's any other questions, I want to thank you, Mart, for staying up. I see you, uh, your your books in the background. So now, I hope you had dinner yet. If you haven't, I hope you have a nice dinner. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I would like to listen to uh, Andrea's presentation as well. Sure. So uh, I'll stay sure. here with you. Uh, thank, thank you. Okay, so we can move on to this uh, second speaker then is Andrea Fisher, and she's a research associate with the uh, search, the study of environmental Arctic change. And she's working with Brendan Kelly. Uh, her focus on, is on environmental policy. So I find that really interesting, Andrea. So I'd like to hear that even further later on at sidebar. But she's gonna speak to us about the Arctic Frontiers uh, 2050 conference for this fall. So with that, uh, you're on. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me today. And Marit, thank you for your presentation as well. I'll just share my screen. Can you hear me okay? I can. <laughs> okay. Oh, nice kayak. Oh, thanks. Okay. Okay, so as Jackie mentioned, uh, I work for the study of environmental Arctic change, also known as SEARCH. Uh, and today I wanted to introduce an international Arctic conference called Arctic Futures 2050 that will be occurring in Washington, D.C. this coming September. Since I believe some of you already know some things about SEARCH, I'll only give a brief overview of the program. Uh, SEARCH has convened numerous institutions and various researchers to advance uh, synthesis and um, in respect to processes and consequences of diminishing sea ice, melting land ice, and thawing permafrost. And these are the topics of the three action teams, as you can see in the the image I have on the screen. Uh, Search also recognized the importance of sharing these research findings with decision makers. So we started producing search uh, or one to two page research briefs called Arctic Answers that answer policy relevant questions regarding Arctic changes. As Search has worked on documenting what we do know about Arctic change and sharing this information with various decision makers, uh, we're realizing that with the rapid environmental changes we're seeing in the Arctic, it seems like we need to be doing more when it comes to collaborations, communication tools, and uh, different research needs. So for example, when uh, a researcher is trying to deliver information to a decision maker, how can they do this in a more timely manner or that's more usable to a policymaker? Or how can researchers gain a better understanding of what the information needs are for policymakers in the first place? So on that front, and to understand how we can better navigate the future of Arctic environmental change, uh, Search will be convening a conference this September 4th through 6th in Washington, D.C. at the National Academy of Sciences. 
the conference will bring together uh, Arctic scientists, indigenous knowledge holders, and policymakers from all levels of government. And the, the conference has quite a narrow focus as we'll be jointly exploring uh, what information and processes are needed to inform decisions concerning the Arctic in the coming decades. Uh, these are some of the, the questions or the topics that we hope to jointly explore at the conference. Uh, it includes what partnerships uh, are needed when it comes to partnerships with different researchers or partnerships with a researcher and decision makers. Uh, we'll also hopefully discuss what research is needed to uh, basic and applied to be able to inform uh, decisions or respond to such changes. And um, other topics as well, what other obstacles are in the way of science being able to inform policy effectively, whether that's financial or communication based. So I wanted to share a small excerpt from the agenda, which can be found on the website uh, that I'll share with you. Uh, but I thought it would be, be good just to see one section of the agenda, even though it doesn't go into much detail. Um, it does share how we'll be talking about what we know um, sharing up-to-date science um, and talking about what we still need to know and also other panels and talks will go over what um, how we can better share this information and case studies of how science has informed policy in the Arctic. Uh, so as you'll see there's short talks as well as uh, panel discussions. Many of the panel discussions will have one uh, researcher, one indigenous knowledge holder, and one policymaker to bring a different perspective uh, for the specific topic. Uh, and there will also be a variation of local, federal, and international participants, topics, and speakers. So after this call, um, if you have any suggestions for speakers, uh, we're happy to, to hear those. There will also be opportunities for you to share research. Um, one way is through posters that we'll have uh, sessions for each day. Uh, this is an opportunity to share your research and uh, make sure some decision makers in the room uh, get a chance to see it. Um, it could also be a poster on examples how your research has informed decisions. Um, or there are other avenues for you to take as long as it aligns with uh, some of the themes and topics of the conference. Uh, the application is open online and the deadline is May 1st. Um, more information on the application is, is online, as I said. Uh, before any questions and conversation, I'd like to leave you with some uh, more information on the dates and deadlines. Uh, one, registration opens April 1st, so that's coming up. Um, you can find the applications um, and more information on the search website, which I've given here, or you can Google Arctic Futures 2050 to find this website and more information. Uh, there will also be travel support for early career uh, researchers and indigenous knowledge holders, um, and those will be available April 1st for, for applying. Uh, I hope that uh, you consider participating, and please free, uh, feel free to share this with colleagues. Um, and you can contact me, my email's at the bottom of the screen, if you have any questions or ideas following this call. And uh, so I'd now like to open it up to questions and also if anyone is interested in sharing your thoughts on the need for such discussions that will be taking place at this conference um, or is, your, is knowledge informing policy an area of interest for you and, um, and related to your work. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. That was very interesting, and then it uh, looks like it's going to be an exciting meeting. Um, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you might have. So the registration, is it open now, or uh, the uh, my, it opens April 1st? When does it close? Um, I believe it's um, going up until the conference date. Okay. Yes. Okay. 
But uh, the important date there I see is June as the date for travel uh, announcements, but also the deadline for those on the 3rd so of June. I mean, that's when the decisions will be made, but the absolute deadline for submission of abstracts is May 1, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. So, oh, Andrea, this is Sarah Bowden. I'm with the IRFIC Secretariat. And um, <clears throat> I was interested when you talked about the, um, that there'll be opportunities for international um, participation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's um, great that we have Marit on the line if she's still there. Because I do think the Norwegians do this better than most countries in terms of ensuring that their policymakers are aware of and know about um, changes that are occurring in and around Norway, which includes um, the Barents and, and um, the Arctic overall. And so I wonder if you've reached out, like how you're interacting with other countries to find people like Marit or um, Paul Vossman and others that could really help inform this discussion. Yes, so I actually um, made a trip to Norway and met with Marit just uh, a few weeks ago and Paul Vossman uh, the Norwegian Polar Institute and the Research Council, various entities. So that was a little bit more targeted outreach um, for countries um, like Norway. But um, my supervisor, Brendan Kelly, also has this past week met with uh, embassy representatives in DC um, from various countries. Uh, so it's, we're working in different ways to try to reach different uh, country representatives, um, but if you have any suggestions on, on other ways, that would, be, that would be helpful. That's great, you were already 10 steps ahead. Thanks, Andrea. Mm -hmm. uh, may, uh, may I ask? And uh, thank you, Marit. <laughs> <I'm, laughs> uh, this is Marit again. Um, I, I would like to hear more about what kind of scientists would you like? We have uh, had a discussion in the Nansen Legacy group, and uh, I think uh, we will try to, to send someone to, to participate because I think we have a lot of common interest. But uh, since we have people from uh, whether you like someone more on the leader side or more on the uh, projective science or more on the communication with uh, policymakers, um, well, what do you think will be most useful? Yeah, uh, so I pulled up the agenda again. Um, so we do have panel discussions on permafrost, land ice, sea ice, um, but we'll also be having, yeah, it's, it's difficult to say. Uh, maybe it's worth having another conversation um, with my supervisor and just to try to figure that out because um, we'll be having different case studies that could include various other types of researchers, um, but it's important that we also are, have representation policy-wise from Norway and other countries. So there are a lot of places. Um, so maybe having a discussion on what would work best for both of us would be good. Hmm. That sounds like a good plan. And I think it's a, it's a great initiative and I think it's a great way of doing it to, to have a, a meeting facilitating the discussion and getting different perspectives. And so we have thoughts along the same line. So, uh, hmm. yeah, thank you. Andrea, this is Amy Holman in Anchorage. Uh, just so I can make sure I explain this well. So a uh, registration is for the invitees, right? Uh, registration is for anyone who's interested in participating. Okay, so in, in the about the mm -hmm. uh, uh, piece, is is there this, can you tell me a little bit more about how many people you kind of can handle and mm -hmm. um, invitations, who's going to, how that's going to happen, kind of who's going to be there uh, to help me try to encourage or, or not encourage people to sign up? Yeah, so our aim for the conference is around 400 um, to 500 people. I think that's around our max. So it's, it's a pretty large conference in space. Um, and when it comes to invites for speakers and other things, that's something that is just um, being rolled out. So again, if there's 
somebody or um, that you'd like to suggest, um, that would be a good time to email me or Brennan Kelly's um, email that was there. Um, but uh, I just wanted to pull up, there is more specific information on the website um, about the conference if I didn't go into enough detail for anyone. Um, did that answer your question or how can I better help? Yeah, no, that's really helpful. If you know, About midway down, a little past midway down, past the bullets, I saw that invitees piece and I was uh, just making sure that uh, this was more open uh, than just folks who were going to get a letter say, please register. Um, um, so, so that's great. Um, one follow up on is about how many posters are you hoping to have? Um, I'll have to follow up with you on that. I, I know we will have three sessions of posters. Um, so, but I cannot remember the exact number at this moment. Thanks, Andrea. And thanks, Jackie, for letting me jump in and ask some questions. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. I was going to ask, and maybe I'm wrong, under program, is there a draft agenda yet, or is that still being modified? And yes. if it's not developed, it'll be great when it's up there, because then I think that'll help with Amy and others. Like, I'm going over to Japan and Korea, and I'd like to be able to mention this in there, and there, there we go. So it'd be good to, for those folks, a way for them to understand what the core part of the meeting is. Yeah, so the draft brief right. agenda is online, but I think once we have more details on there, it'll be much, it'll be easier for people to see. So hopefully more details will be coming soon. Sure, and the only other thing I was going to ask is if you had a, a real brief slide deck at all, if you would like to be presented, I don't know if you're going, if you're doing anything in Japan and Korea, but I'd be happy at the meetings I'm going to with the Central Arctic Ocean and the Arctic on the, uh, on the Asian side to at least let the organizers know about this meeting. So a flyer, something yeah. like that. Yeah, I can share an informational just, flyer for just sure. Just let me know. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, Andrea. Andrea, this is uh, Candace with NOAA Fisheries in Silver Spring. Thank you for the presentation. Really helpful. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention, kind of following on, I think, to Sarah and reaching out internationally. Um, on the Indigenous side, I'm hoping that you guys are going to reach out in Canada and with the Inuit. Um, the meeting I just got back from in, um, in Nunavut has made me realize how far advanced and leaps and bounds Canada is ahead of, of m many of the other Arctic nations in working with indigenous communities and incorporating them into the science of the changes that are going on um, in the Arctic. So you and I can talk offline if you want, but I think there are some really good opportunities to bring um, Canadian folks into this. Yes, thank you. And uh, yeah, we do have an indigenous participation working group um, but anyways, that we can expand on that. I know we have been talking about bringing in speakers from Canada to talk on this subject specifically, um, but it'd be nice to have a conversation with you as well. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Well, both for, for Andrea as well as if there's any others for Mart, otherwise I'm gonna turn this back <laughs> to Meredith. All right. Thank you very much. That was very informative.